participants welcome back to uh, lecture number 7 of uh, the 14 day lecture series uh, titled dialectics 2022 an introduction to contemporary critical theories today we have among us uh, dr karishma bisht and on behalf of team dad voice uh, i welcome you dr karishma for accepting our invitation and uh, taking on the the challenging task of uh addressing and delivering your lecture to a heterogeneous group and on behalf of team dadwaj i take the opportunity to introduce dr karishma bish to our participants dr karishma bish did her phd from gurukul kangri vishwavidyalaya haridwar and she qualified her ugc net in july 2018 did her masters in english from isabella thoban college in lucknow and she started her career uh, in in this same college of her since july 2019 so far she has published nine research papers in ugc recognized and peer reviewed journals and has also presented nine papers at national and international seminars she has also published a book titled unraveling the concepts of psychoanalysis through rasa and dhavni a study of the plays of tennessee williams she is also inclined in creative writing and has published her poems in three poetry anthologies her key research areas include critical theories and understanding various cultural aspects in world literature on behalf of team dad voyage uh, dr karishma i take this opportunity to welcome you and myself and shreya ma'am take the opportunity to welcome you uh, without wasting much time the platform is all yours dr karishma Thank you so much, sir, for that gracious introduction. I hope I'm audible to you. Yes. Yes. All right. So before I begin, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Shreya Bhattacharya, ma'am, and Dr. Sekhar Banerjee, sir, and the entire team of Dart Voyage for giving me this opportunity yet again to present uh, a lecture in this platform. And uh, I hope that all of you find. Uh, are able to attain some sort of information and guidance from this lecture so without further ado i would quickly like to begin with my lecture uh, so let's begin so the topic for today that we have is psychoanalysis now when we deal with this particular domain psychoanalysis we often think about the perspective of uh, what exactly is this realm all about many people when you talk about psychoanalysis they often say that psychoanalysis is mainly dealing with the sexual realm so we are only talking about sexuality and when we are talking about psychoanalysis which is probably the reason why many writers are often offended when they are associated with the psychoanalytical realm and there is another realm that is very important for all of us to understand that psychoanalysis had broken down a lot of boundaries those boundaries which were trying to restrict the very understanding of what human behavior is all about and the person who brought about this cultural change was merely uh, the person's photograph is in front of you that is sigmund freud in the 20th century the breakthrough that he did now when we talk about sigmund freud he is often represented as the person who created or who actually brought about the sec third revolution the first was when we talked about earth not being the center and not really being the very epitome of everything surrounding it later on we came about with the gravitation force concept that was the second revolution and now we are coming to this realm that actually was coming to the forefront mainly because of the devastating situations that were happening around us Freud in his very significant work civilization and his and and its discontents talks about the very sorrow and stress people were experiencing because of the advent of the world war both the world war were in a way were affecting the psychological strain of people's uh, mind and it was in a way causing a lot of stress and trauma to people 
but it was very important to understand that when the stress and trauma is experienced by our mind, it is represented in the form of a symptom. So in order to represent this aspect of symptom, it is very important to understand why a person sometimes shows very erratic behavior or sometimes we notice if you're going for an examination, our hands start shivering. These are known as body symptoms which are usually noticed in neurotic patients, the patients who are showing certain uh, weird tendencies in their body gestures. And these body symptoms can be rectified if you undergo a psychoanalytical therapy by a psychoanalyst, where the psychoanalyst tries to understand the cause of the symptom. So when you understand the actual cause, you're able to calm yourself and you're able to get back to your balanced form which is why psychoanalysis is very important. It helps you in making your mind healthy. So you have a balanced frame of mind and this balanced frame of mind is only catered by the knowledge that psychoanalysis imparts in its very concepts. So this is probably the reason why Freud was given so much significance in the field of literary psychoanalytical criticism. Now, before we study a little intense aspect about what he is really representing here, it is important to understand the very idea that psychoanalysis helps us in understanding the various effects of the mind that are influenced by us through our body behavior. And in particularly, what we are going to interpret in this lecture are mainly two domains. First is the Freudian domain, where we'll be studying about the human behavior, the various ways in which human behavior is represented in front of us. In particularly, our focus of attention is going to be the romantic age, the age that is able to provide you so much insight about the style, the trend, the psychological insight of a writer. All these things will be interpreted through Freudian approach. Now, the reason why I have chosen the romantic age is mainly because romantic age is an age that comes before the very breakthrough ideologies of Freud, which is why this age is more interesting in terms of interpretation. If you happen to read any book that is the critical study of romantic age, you will notice that the romantic age is constantly associated with psychoanalysis. Because just like the psychoanalytical concept, the romantics also believed in the idea of giving more importance to your inner instinct. Your inner voice is something that was given more importance to. And there are other reasons also why this particular age fascinated me more in terms of understanding the Freudian concepts. So we'll be understanding why we have chosen this particular period and how is it helping us in understanding this particular age, that is the romantic age. So let us begin. Now, how is psychoanalysis applicable for the romantic age? This is our first question. So in order to understand this, the things that we need to keep in mind are the three important concepts that Freud gave us in context to the structure of a mind. The mind is divided into three zones, the ego, the superego, and the id. Now, all these three halves of the mind are very important because all the three sections helps us in understanding the various zones and how these zones operate in our day-to-day -day life. Some are very active when we are awake and some are passive, while others are active when we are asleep. So which are these zones and why should you understand them? This is what we are going to interpret first before we give importance to the very core concept that Freud was laying emphasis towards. So let's begin with the first part of the mind, that is the ego. This is the conscious half. You're listening to me in this virtual online lecture. This is your conscious mind at play just now. So why do you have to understand the significance of the ego? Why should the conscious be given so much importance in the Freudian analysis? Because conscious mind is important in terms of understanding the parameters that are there, the things that are there in front of you, the, gen the awareness that is generated in your mind about the objects that are surrounding you. This is what the ego actually does. Now, whenever you start with your interpretation, this conscious is helping you in identifying the objects. 
So when you start interpreting a literary text, there are certain things that your conscious mind needs to notice or observe. What are these important aspects? The three core aspects that you will notice a psychoanalyst always focuses on is the language, the character, and the setting. Why are these things important? Let us understand these three important elements on basis of one of the influential work by a romantic poet of this age. We'll be focusing on the poem written by William Wordsworth that is called Daffodils. Now, I'm sure most of you have read this poem in your high school, at your high school level, or maybe even in your graduation. If I have to tell you the general idea that is represented in this poem is that this poem is, the title itself is telling you what is it about. The picture in front of you, the flower in front of you is what a daffodil looks like. And Wordsworth has given so much importance to this particular flower. Why has he given importance? These are the certain questions that a psychoanalyst has to start with when he's analyzing a particular text on the main domain that psychoanalysis is all about, because you are generally trying to move towards the things that you are not able to understand at the real logical realm. So in order to do that, first you have to understand the surface level elements. Here, let us first talk about the first element that I already talk, spoke about, which is language. Now, if you have a look at the language that is represented here in this poem, it is a very simple usage of words. The language is not at all complex. Have a look at the first stanza here. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high of, over vales and hills, while all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Now you can understand what this poem is about. You don't need a, a special book or reference book to understand what the poet is talking about. It is a simple experience that he's talking about of how he visited this very nature, the bounty of nature and experienced this beautiful side of golden daffodils. So if you look at these expressions, why has he used this simple expression? There is a reason behind it. Because this language represents the very essence of romantic age. The romantic age is the age in which you're giving more importance to ordinary elements over technical elements. Because romantic age has transitioned from an age that was focusing so much on the structure of the language, the way in which you construct your meaning. The language was sometimes a bit technical to understand, but here the usage is very simple. And there is a reason behind it, because this language represents the language of the common people. That is what Wordsworth wanted to focus and emphasize on, that this is the age when we can identify. If we identify this expression with the timeline of this age, we will understand that this is the time when the common man for the first time was doing the impossible, the unimaginable that is raising the voice against those very people who were trying to control and govern them. I'm talking about the very important movement that was the French Revolution, in which for the first time, the common man was able to raise its voice against the aristocracy who were trying to impose taxes and living a lavish lifestyle in their lavish, a house, uh, the, the big villas that they were living in. So they were definitely able to identify with the very exploitation that was being imposed on them, which is why you notice that Wordsworth here wants to use a language that can be understood by every individual who knows how to speak English. So this is how you're doing logical reasoning first about why the poet has used this simple expression here. Let us now move on to the character. If you look into this poem again, which is the character that is being used? There is no individual in particularly. The focus or the foregrounding, as we say, is mainly on this flower, daffodil. Why has the poet laid so much emphasis on this flower? What is so interesting about this flower? It is just a thing that is looking very beautiful. But again, if you look at the sociological timeline of this age, you will understand the reason why the poet is giving importance to the flower is because he is giving more importance to nature over the very thing that the society was giving importance to. 
which is again the advent of the industrial age. The age in which, as Wordsworth says this, uh, says this in one of his very famous poems, the world is too much with us, that we are always spending and we are always wasting our money in buying those expensive products that are wearable in the mall. Who doesn't like to go and window shop and buy the most beautiful bag that is available in the, in the very display? So this is what Wordsworth is also criticizing about the society that, come on, you need to grow up if you really want pleasant temperament within you, if you really want balanced emotions among, inside you, you really need to first understand the things that actually provide you relishment and actually provide you calm demeanor, which is nature. This is probably the reason why Wordsworth was constantly nostalgic about his childhood memories why he wanted to always visit the places where he had spent his childhood most of the time that was close to nature. So this is why a daffodil, again, you get to see the character, the foregrounded character in this particular poem is the daffodil. And that is the reason why the poet is giving so much importance to it in the conscious level. Now let us talk about the third important aspect in the ego domain, which is the setting. Again, it is a natural setting that is used over here, which is again justifiable because I've already discussed this with you, that nature holds a key important factor in this age. This is the place where you are able to identify with yourself only because nature does not have any judgments about you. Nature allows you to relax. Nature allows you to introspect which is what is required in this age. Because of the lack of introspection, people have turned materialistic and the humane values that are there, the idea of kindness, the idea of supporting each other has literally dis disappearing with the passage of time, which is why the poet is representing these key factors in his poem. So now after understanding the very elements in the ego, what do we come, what is the conclusion that we make out of the ego domain? The conclusion that we come up to is that ego is promoting the idea of logical reasoning. You are able to identify with the cause because you're constantly questioning. And that is what the ego does. It allows you to interpret things because you're always questioning the cause for the representation of the thing on the surface level. And that is why this very step is important in the very discourse of psychoanalysis in the Freudian perspective. Let us now move on to the next domain, that is the superego. This is the person, uh, this is the side of the brain which uh, is always telling you what is right and what is wrong. But how do we represent it in the sociological world and how do we interpret it in a work? Now, in order to make you understand what is the significance of superego, it is important to first identify with the elements that are represented in superego. We are mainly focusing on the plot and we are also focusing on the story. Why exactly are we focusing on the plot? We are focusing on the plot because in order to tell you the significance of plot holds, I would like to take you back to a very significant text that was written by a very well-known Greek writer in front of you, that is Aristotle. In his work, Poetics, he talks about the very idea of why a plot is considered to be the soul of tragedy. Now, we all aware what Poetics is all about. Poetics is a work in which Aristotle is giving maximum attention to tragedy over comedy. The reason being because tragedy is able to generate a feeling of social consciousness amongst us. We are able to identify with the beliefs of the society, what is wrong and what is right. So that is what tragic plays are all about. Whenever you read a tragedy uh, of any form, you would definitely be able to identify why is that tragedy considered to be of so much relevance? Because that tragedy will help you to identify with the very social moral values of that system. So this is why a tragedy, a, a particularly super ego helps you in identifying with the ideology of the society. 
Now, I'm sure that all of you identify with this word because so far the lecture series that you have seen, which have been so enriching because I've literally enjoyed each one of them. Ideology is a concept that many writers have focused on. And we know that ideology always represents the idea of the governing party. So if you're talking about a society, ideology will always represent the perceptions or the beliefs of the people who are controlling the society. So this is the reason why ideology helps you in identifying with the very beliefs of the society. And in order to understand this, let me show you these very significant lines again that have been taken from Wordsworth's very influential work, The Prelude, in which he is giving you a reference about the social belief of the time. So now here, what you notice is the, the gesture, the belief, because th there is a kind of uh, sociological ideology that is being represented here in the very lines, which says, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. So what is this bliss that he's talking about? Again, this bliss is the very movement that is the French Revolution, in which people spoke against the very people who were controlling them the aristocracy, because in France, when the French Revolution happened, what you notice is that for the first time, a king was executed public in the public platform. And this was done because they had enough of the tyrant governance of the king, and they really wanted to address their concern. So this is why Wordsworth over here represents this very idea of identifying with the very spirit, the unity of the people, which is why he says, if you really want to identify with the very spirit that people had, the energy that they had, you had to be there because that energy would literally awaken you. It's like going and watching a cricket match. Does that not, if somebody has to tell you, oh, let's watch uh, the live show in the TV format, which one would you prefer? Of course, the one that is allowing you to go and see it in the real format, not the virtual format, because that energy, the level at which people shout, scream, that is so enriching. And this is what Wordsworth also here is associating with the idea of support and the energy that people had and shared with each other. Not only this, you can also identify with the very notion why poets like William Blake and Wordsworth, again, talk about the very concept of constantly addressing the life story of young children in urban locations. Why, do, why does Blake always does that? If you happen to read the work, Songs of Innocence and Experience by William Blake, you will notice that he's constantly talking about the lifestyle of young children in the urban city. Why is he doing that? The reason why he does that is again to generate social awakening about the wrong that is being done. The idea of child labor is being represented here. How people are not able to sustain well and that, that the very difficulty of sustenance has forced the parents to make their child do these very menial chores. And they're not easy chores, they're quite difficult. They're cleaning the chimneys. They are having no kind of provisions in the very institutes that they are being sent to. So this is the kind of thing, these are the kind of social values that you can identify this uh, with when you, whenever you are studying the super ego realm which is again very important in terms of the plot and the way in which the story is constructed. So this is how we can understand with the very idea of superego. Now, even today, we have to associate superego with our beliefs even today. So if I have to talk about the common trend that is happening because of the pandemic, all of us have been experiencing a lot of emotional distress, let's say, because things have often come to a standstill, but we have learned to cope up with the stress. And the very important thing that superego can be used for, even in our day-to-day -day life, is the idea of enforcing a very strong belief system. 
Now, this belief system sometimes can be addressed with the idea of affirmations. This is something that I practice in my day-to-day -day life. I always try to uh, represent some thoughts on a white paper. And the moment I get up in the morning, I always look up to those words and try to instill those very essence of those words within me. I am instilling the value that that word represents within myself. Again, a very important practice of affirmations. What you write is what you become. So this is again a concept of reinforcement that the super ego can do. And we can implement that within us if we constantly keep practicing the idea of reinforcing faith that the society believes in. So this is again very important. Now let us come to the core uh, domain of a mind that Freud was interested in. Now, Freud represented the unconscious almost to the very figure of an iceberg. Now, when you happen to look at the iceberg, a small block of ice in, in the middle of the ocean, you would notice that the ice, if it is a huge bulk of ice, it will only be submerged. Most of the portion will be submerged within the water and only the tip will be in the surf on the will be visible on the surface level. Now, this very iceberg technique, now that if you notice that most of the half of the ice is submerged in the water, this is what Freud describes as the realm of the unconscious. It is immense in concepts and beliefs and desires, but it is something that is hidden because the only time when the unconscious is active is when we are asleep. And that is the reason why it is very difficult to understand the principles of unconscious mind. Many people have tried to understand this very realm even before Freud had conceptualized the concept of the unconscious realm. That is, he had mainly propounded the idea that dreams are the road to the unconscious mind. So if you want to interpret what desire you are instilling within you, you have to understand your dreams. Sometimes you may get a disturbed dream. So that disturbed dream may address some sort of desire or some sort of concern that you have that your unconscious is not able to address in reality. So often those very beliefs where you notice that the very next day you have an exam and what you notice in your dream is that you will constantly experience the feeling in which you're writing your paper and the examiner comes and takes away your paper. And you are, immediately you wake up. So what does this tell you? This tells you the very idea of something. The dream is never complete. It is always in partial representation. And somehow you're not able to identify with what was the meaning of it. What was it indicative of? Was I able to finish my paper in the dream? Or was it uh, that the, or was the examiner sympathetic towards me? What was the conclusion? Nobody knows, but that is what is the significance of this realm. It will never describe things in its totality, which is why the unconscious mind is important. But you can understand the aspects of the unconscious sometimes even in your behavior. This is where psychoanalysis is considered to be very important for Freud. And when he started this practice of understanding and exploring the human behavior, the first thing he would do is ask his patient to sit on the couch, lie down, and just express anything that comes in his mind. So he doesn't have to start with the dream. Talk about your life. Talk about where, how, what, talk about the things that you remember and gradually move towards your dream. This very technique is called the technique of free association. Now, when this happens, what happens is that you're able to identify with the root cause of your desire, which is the reason why sometimes unconscious can also be identified in our behavior. And in our behavior, we notice this usually in the form of illogical gestures which is what Freud wanted to focus on a lot. The most important illogical behavior that he associated in this process of free association were his childhood memories. Now, Freud was very intrigued by the very notion of reading many literary texts. Among them, he happened to read a very famous work by the Greek writer, Sophocles. The name of this book was Oedipus Rex, which is about a king who unknowingly kills his father and marries his mother. Now, after 
the very realization, the king punishes himself, he literally removes his eyes and there, it is a tragedy. So definitely, as I told you, this tragedy definitely does awaken a sort of awakening among the people that, oh my God, how could this man marry his mother? It is a social, uh, you are definitely going against the social norms. That is what the unconscious always does. It is illogical because it does not follow the rules of the society. This is what we all need to understand about the unconscious, which is why it is never given importance in reality. Because sometimes the desire that the unconscious has can be socially unethical, which is the reason why it is called illogical behavior. Now, if you have to understand the various ways in which this unconscious gesture or behavior is represented, Freud was again interested in this particular tale that I narrated to, to all of you just now about this desire the child has for the mother and unconsciously wanting to kill his own father. This is a thing that Freud was also able to associate with his own life, which is the reason why he came up with a very intriguing concept. That is the concept of complexes. What do we understand by complex? Complex always represents ideas, desires, and perceptions of our unconscious mind. Complex can come in different formats. The complex that Freud was focusing on was Oedipus complex because the word Oedipus has been derived from the very play that he studied, which is a complex that is an unconscious behavior which is not socially considered to be ethical, but this very practice of having attraction towards your own mother is what is the Oedipus complex. Now the complexes comes in different format. We have superiority complex, inferiority complex, Helen complex, Peter Pan complex. These are various complexes that have come over the ages. And if you happen to research these complexes, you will come across many that you can apply in many fields, not only psychoanalytical, but also apply the very concepts of psychoanalysis in other discourses like post-colonial discourses, Marxist perspectives. So the horizon is very big for you. But here we are mainly focusing on the illogical behavior that the unconscious is mainly concerned or attracted towards. So the first, like I told you, is the Oedipus complex, where the child is more attracted or associates more with the mother. Now, you may ask me, or for the people who are definitely understanding this very perspective, is it only for boys? Is it not for girls? Yes, we will come to that. But before this, the Oedipus complex leads to another form of complex, which is very interesting. And I would want all of you to now shift your attention to another complex, which is called castration complex. Now this complex is usually noticed in a child when he understands the very idea that my father is basically more stronger than me. He has the same biological construct like me, but the only thing that he has, that the thing that I do not have within me is the strength that my father has. He is bigger, he's stronger, and he has the potential to even take away my biological representation because of his strength. He can kill me if he wants. That is exactly what happened even in the story Oedipus, Rex. The reason why uh, the story actually starts with the concept where the father is attempting to kill his own son because the Greeks were very much like, you can associate the culture of Greeks with a little bit to that of Hindus because they also believe in the idea of prophecy. So one of the sages in, the, in this particular work comes up to the king and tells the king that your son is going to kill you. And this very news disturbs the king. So the first thing the king does is he asks one of his uh, soldier to take the child and kill it in the seaside. Now the soldier is very sympathetic and does not really kill the child. He gives it to a shepherd. That is where the shepherd trains, uh, grooms the child. Slowly the child attains maturity and unknowingly, he again goes to the very place where his father is, actually his biological father is staying. He happens to kill his father and marry his own mother. 
So that is the tragic end over here. But what we notice is that castration complex is something that is inherent in every male child. This is probably the reason why the child always aspires to be stronger and better than his father which is why you come across many new concepts whenever you're studying about a writer, especially male writers. There is an interesting concept that was given and proposed by Harold Bloom. It's called anxiety of influence. Now, this is a tendency that has caused mainly because of this castration complex, which is inherent in every writer. Now, as we move from Augustan age to romantic age, what do you notice is that the style is very different. This is very deliberate. We do not wish to imitate our forefathers. We always want to emerge different, unique. And that is what the writers in the Romantic age were also aiming at. They constantly have this feel of not being compared with their forefathers, which is why they constantly try to look very different. So another concept that you come across here is the castration complex, which leads to tendencies such as anxiety of influence in writers male writers. Now let us talk about another anxiety. This is called anxiety of authorship. This is associated with the complex that I already spoke about, that is Electra complex. Now, just like men, uh, like a young boy, by a, a child, a male child is mainly interested in mother. Similarly, a girl child is interested in his father. But now here's the slight change in terms of the emotion that the child experiences where the male child feels jealous, the female child is constantly feeling insecure. Now, why is the girl child feeling insecure? The reason being because her biological construct is nowhere close to the father. Biologically, she is very different in looks and she identifies with that factor, which is the reason why woman is constantly given a insecurity uh, emotional constitution because of which she is constantly looking for support. She doesn't look for that idea of independence. This is probably the reason why you will notice if you come across the introductory books to psychoanalysis, many feminist writers have literally uh, scrutinized Freud. And the reason why they have done that is because Freud always associates negative emotional traits with women. That is the reason why this concept that is anxiety of authorship was mainly given by two seminal writers, American writers, Susan Goober and Gilbert in their work, Mad Woman in the Attic. This work has been inspired from the work written by one of the Bronte sisters called Jane Eyre, where the woman, that is the mad woman here is the very uh, lady that uh, was not able to address her concern because she was mentally not in her balanced state of mind. That is the reason why society ignores this woman who has been given importance in this particular work that has been written by these two American writers. Now, what is anxiety of authorship then? Anxiety of authorship is this very insecurity that female writers experience because they have no forefathers to look up to. Let us take a look at the 16th century, for instance. Do you really come across a female writer in the 16th century? I don't think so. The only writer that I can really navigate through is the one in the 17th century, that is Afra Ben. Now, what is interesting about Afra Ben, again, if you happen to read her in your syllabus, you would notice that this writer is a contemporary of John Dryden. But what is interesting is the way this writer is treated by the vast majority. Both the writers were very good. Uh, they were writing plays. And what you notice in the way in which people uh, associate with them is very different. Where people were giving so much importance to John Dryden, Afrowen was constantly humiliated, not only by public, but also by the actors who were performing her plays. They would often change the lines. And these aspects have been represented even in this text, Mad Woman in the Attic, which is the reason why anxiety of authorship is constantly experienced by female writers, because they have no one to look up to. And when they are expressing themselves, they're always expressing themselves in some 
hidden identifying factor, which is probably the reason why in the Victorian age, you notice uh, most of the writers, not only Victorian, let's talk about the romantic, since we are focusing on the romantic age, most of the writers, female writers, were first publishing their book anonymously. This is probably the reason why they had to live in an incognito life. That is, a pseudo feminism had been has to be established for themselves in order to be first be get that kind of response from the people to be accepted. They had to first disclose their identity, which is what anxiety of authorship is mainly addressing towards. So this is what is very influential in terms of complexes. I would urge you people to read more about these complexes if you're interested in this domain, which will help you to interpret various unusual behaviors that you often notice in the texts. Like for instance, Oedipus complex is also to be noticed in the very famous work written by William Shakespeare, that is Hamlet. Why does Hamlet constantly show so much aggression towards his mother? There is a reason behind it. He is not paying attention to the factor that Hamlet is supposed to have a task in this tragedy. He has to kill the very person who killed his father. That is the brother uh, of this particular king, his father. So he has to kill this enemy, but his attention is completely deviated towards his mother. He cannot accept the fact that the mother is not mourning for the father because he expects somewhere in his unconscious, he expects that now that the father is no longer there, the mother should come to the child for emotional support, which the mother is not doing. So which is again a reason why this work is often being represented by the modernist poet T.S. Eliot as the Mona Lisa of literature, because just like the portrait of Mona Lisa, it is mysterious. You can't understand why the delay is really happening in the play all throughout. But psychoanalysis helps you to identify with illogical behaviors, such as Oedipus complex. So this is one way of interpreting things. Now let us also talk about some very interesting factors, the energy, the sexual energy that Freud constantly talks about. He represented this unconscious realm has a sort of energy in it, a sexual energy, because Freud was only interested in the sexuality realm. So when we talk about this sexual realm, the energies can be represented in two forms. The first is eros, that is your libidinal energy, that is the energy that allows you, activates you. And the other is the death instinct, which is also known as thanatos. If we have to understand this concept, in relation to the poets in the Romantic age, let us now deviate our attention to the younger Romantic poets, such as Lord Byron, Phoebe Shelley, and John Keats. What kind of energy or sexual energy do we notice in, or emotional intensity do we notice in their poems? Let us have a look at the poem of Lord Byron. Now, if you happen to read the work, She Walks in Beauty in the Night, which is considered to be a very famous ballad that is written by this particular poet. You will notice that there is a lot of eros that is represented, the libidinal energy of mysterious way in possessing that very mysterious woman that is represented in this poem, which is again showing you the manner in which eros can represent itself in a forceful manner, because this is again a very important attribute of the unconscious realm. It always represents itself in impulsive gestures. It never represents itself in a balanced form. So unconscious will always represent itself in intense representations. So this is probably the reason why you notice Byron's poem has a lot of intensity in terms of the manner in which he expresses or describes this woman that he cannot possess, but he wants to. The unconscious is desiring it. And all that energy of aspiring for this woman has been represented in this very poem. Let us now talk about the next poet over here, that is P.B. Shelley. Now, again, a very famous ode that is written by him, Ode to the West Wind, where the poet P.B. Shelley is giving importance to the very West Wind that is able to lift everything that comes on its way. And it is able to provide the energy and intensity to every dead aspect that follows with it. And that is the reason why P.B. Shelley is also requesting 
the West Wind to take it, to lift it and provide him the motivation, the energy with which it is blowing everywhere in every corner of the world, whether it is a dead leaf or anything that comes on its way. So this is a very interesting factor that you get to see again, the, the force that is represented here in the West Wind, which is again a form of energy, the vital energy that is represented in the West Wind, which can be interpreted as a sexual front that the unconscious is aspiring because unconscious is not able to attain the realistic representation. So it is always urging it through creative productions. The next energy that I spoke of is Thanatos, that is the death drive. Now Thanatos is an energy that leads you towards suicidal tendencies. So often when a person experiences this energy, there is a sort of melancholic, almost a pace in which you're not really able to associate with the idea of vitality. It is the opposite of vitality. You become pessimistic. You become very introspective, but not with the intent of positivity, with the intent of negativity, which is why you develop suicidal tendencies in your very expression. It is almost as if you are melancholic. Now, this was a very interesting term that Sigmund Freud used in many of his psychoanalytical works that he wrote, the concept of melancholia. What is melancholia? This painting in front of you, if you notice, what is this woman doing in the painting? She is seemingly in a melancholic state. In the Romantic age, melancholia was associated with the idea of constantly being lost in your thoughts. So if a person is thinking too much, way too much, and not able to associate with the world around him or her, he is in a melancholic position. So this is something that you could notice even in the day to day in our day to day life. Let me give you a small reference of a very uh, recent incident that has happened that took the virtual media for a stir. Now, what you have in front of you is a very well known. She is a famous, uh, well known face in the in the in the fashion industry. Her name is Bella Hadid. And what you see in front of her is a very well-known statement dress that she wore in the Cannes Film Festival. Why am I showing you this photograph? Not because I want you to focus on the dress. I want you to look at the iconic representation she has. And the very unacceptable thing that she does in her very social media status. This is the image that she posted in one of her social media uh, platforms in which she has taken a selfie of her in a crying state. Now, nobody likes to take selfie of this format. This was a very unusual trend that had started in which many people were posting selfies of themselves in which they were crying. Now, if you get to see this expression from this lady who has name, fame, everything, have a look at her. If you have a look at her family background or the people she associates with, they are all influential people. Have a look at her partner, again, an influential man. Sister, again, a very well-known model. And why is this lady posting this image? She has the best of all, the best of all she could possibly imagine. Why is she crying over here? There is almost a sort of melancholic disposition represented in her very statement that she states over here for this particular picture, where she states that people forget that everyone is basically feeling the same way, lost, confused, not really sure why they're here. So what does this tell you? That the Thanatos is able to put you in that mental frame of mind where you're not able to associate with your social surroundings. This is what exactly happened with John Keats. He was not able to associate with his social surroundings. Why is that? Because as an individual, now psychoanalysis is very much keeping an account of a person's life history. So if you look into the life history of John Keats, you will notice that whether it was his family front or whether it was his professional front, he was not experiencing a fulfillment of his aim or aspirations in life, which is probably the reason why you notice that in his poem, Ode to the Nightingale, He's not wishing, he's really wanting to leave the present world and move towards the world in which 
the nightingale is living because the nightingale doesn't really have to experience the social criticism that the world is always, oh, you didn't do it so well. You don't do this. You're working hard. You're putting all the efforts, but you're not really being appreciated for your effort. That is probably the reason why even this famous model is showing this melancholic state of mind. She's putting her effort, but probably she's not really fulfilled feeling fulfilled about the efforts that she's putting or the aim that she has in life. And that is probably the reason why you notice a Thanatos energy in the work of John Keats. So this is one perspective that you get to see, these two binary energies that Freud have often spoken of in his works and that you can also represent when you interpret the romantic poets based on the level of energies that they show how they are shifting to vitality, and then sometimes they are shifting to negativity, that is pessimism. Now, let us also talk about some more aspects that Freud wanted to analyze based on the uh, unconscious realm. That is irregularity that an individual can experience at many forefronts. Now, when I talk about this, this very irregularity concept may somehow correlate with the concept that was given by a very well-known writer of the 16th century. I'm talking about the writer Ben Johnson. If you've read any of his works, he is well known for writing in the genre of comedy. And what is known over here is that his works are mainly dealing with the concept of comedy of humors. What is comedy of humors? In the 16th century, People had not really discovered the, may, the human anatomy very well. And that is the reason why they were in a way taking source or references from the Greek concepts. Now the Greek concepts believed in the very concept that a human body is composed of fluids. We have four basic liquids in our body. And whenever there is an imbalance in these liquids, there is a irregularity that is experienced in our behavior. This is what Ben Johnson believed in, and that is the reason why he wanted to really criticize these very irreg irregularities that human beings often represent in their day-to-day -day life, which is why they cannot really think in a logical state because their unconscious is constantly activated. Now for Freud, the very idea of balance is established from your very childhood. So child is a very important source of identification about a person's emotional development, which is the reason why now we are going to focus on another important development that takes place in the growth of a child. That is the stages that the child has to experience in order to make the unconscious because unconscious is constantly exploring itself as the child is growing in age. There are different ways in which the child is able to explore the unconscious realm through the behaviors. The first realm of the sexual discourse that Freud talks about is the oral stage, when the child gets the nourishment from the mother. The second stage is when he is from in the age group of one to three years, where he's learning the very art of how to control his bowel movements. So that is what is considered to be the anal stage. Here, the very idea of excretion. So you'll often notice whenever the child often is trained potty trained whenever you, the initial stage when the child starts understanding how he is supposed to control the very fluids that move out of his body. This is very important because this again shows the realm in which the body is gradually developing itself, balancing itself by experiencing a phenomenon that helps the unconscious to stabilize itself by being in that particular realm where it belongs. And lastly, the important stage is the phallic stage. This is where he identifies with his own reproductive construct. This is again important because the child has to explore this in order to mature as a balanced individual. Now, why are these zones very important? Because what happens in an individual is that sometimes an individual is not really able to experience these stages to the fullest when the child is young. So, the fixation is something that the child, that the mature individual experiences. If there is a problem or a trouble that an individual is experiencing, you can often go back to those very behavioral sexual uh, 
initiations that you had actually experienced as a child. So this very phenomenon of going back to the very phenomenon that a child is experiencing during its sexual development, this very phenomenon is called fixation. Where you are relating, where you're showing the signs of those emotional constructs that the child is representing in his childhood in your very behavior. So that is what is the concept of fixation. This is again a very interesting repetitive behavioral format that you will notice in people. Fixations can come in various formats in all the three realms, that is the oral fixation, the anal fixation, and the phallic fixation. Oral fixation is when you are constantly occupied, when your mouth is constantly occupied with certain uh, associations, object associations, like a person who is profusely smoking. Again, you notice people smoke because they are stressed, they have a lot of strain in their head, but this very oral fixation is moving you back to the very childhood phase in which the child was exploring a sense of gratification through the nourishment that the mother was giving, but now that nourishment has been replaced by a cigarette. Especially even chewing a gum could be an oral fixation because what you're doing is that you are attempting to calm yourself in the very repetitive process of chewing a gum constantly. That is what, uh, that is the reason probably why you notice when a truck drivers, the people who are transporting, moving from place to place, often are seen chewing gum because according to psychologists in the modern day, they say chewing gum is supposed to enhance your level of concentration when, while you're driving. So it eases the anxiety, it eases the stress that the conscious is constantly trying to represent in our body when we are not in a very uh, calm state of mind. So this is probably the reason why fixations come in various behavioral formats. Anal fixation is for a person who is trying to be a control freak. So if you are too much into cleaning, that is again showing a tendency of oral fixation. You're too much with your obsessed with your cell phones, again, a oral fix, uh, a anal fixation. Phallic fixations would be when you're trying to showcase a too much because phall phallic fixation is all about exploring more about yourself. So when you're trying to showcase yourself, that narcissistic self, you are definitely showing a, or, a, a phallic fixation. Now let us just understand these fixations in the behavioral discourse of a particular text from this romantic age. We'll be focusing on the text written by Mary Shelley titled Frankenstein. Now I am sure all of you know this text. Halloween is the day when everybody likes to dress up like this monster from this particular text. So the person with the green colored face is often the modern day interpretation for the monster in this particular text that is constructed by the scientist Frankenstein. Now, what is interesting in this work is that there are three prime characters. The first character is the one who is taking you the novel itself starts with a voyage. A person is particularly partaking a voyage and that voyage that he's taking, he happens to see two people, one person pursuing another person. This person gets to interact with this very person who is not keeping very well. And as they share their discourses, we get to know the life of three important people. The first is the monster. The second is the scientist. And the third is the explorer. Now, in all three of them, you notice that there is a level of fixation tendency that is noticed in their behavior because they are repeating the very discourse of fixation in order to satisfy their unconscious mind. The first is the monster. Now the monster is experiencing fixation because the anxiety that the monster is experiencing is not being able to live his life to the fullest. So that is probably the reason why he wants to destroy the life of his creator. So everyone who is associated with the scientist is literally killed by this monster. And that is the, probably the reason why he has a oral fixation. The oral fixation here is the idea of the need, the hunger that the monster has in terms of devouring everything that is associated with the very scientist. Next, we have the scientist himself. 
when we look at the life of the scientist, what we notice is that he is one person who is showing tendencies of phallic fixation. Phallic fixation is where you are trying to control things. He is trying to be the controller by trying to do the impossible. Who created man? God created man, as has been represented in the Bible. God created Adam and Eve. But can Adam and Eve create something without the biological discourse? Can they insert life through the physical domain? This scientist was able to do the impossible. He was able to create something that was only possible for God to do. And that is exactly what he did. He created something so ugly, so grotesque, without the need of the biological process that is required in order to create an, another living being. So this is how he created. He tried to go against the very providence of God, which is to do the impossible, create a new creature by his knowledge, by the knowledge that he had, this idea of control. This is a very Faustian attitude that this person had, the idea of controlling things. This is probably the reason why this character has been represented as the modern Prometheus, the very character in the Greek stories who gave the fire, went against the very character's use and provided the fire, the beacon of light to the humanity and allowed them to have a life of their own. They no longer had to be dependent on the gods because this particular person, Prometheus, did the impossible. He provided them the very knowledge of the fire. That is how they were able to do things on their own now. So the very idea of going against, the idea of controlling things is definitely represented in this work through this character. Also the final stage, that is the stage of exploration, trying to do the impossible that the explorer in this novel was trying to do. He was definitely trying to create, explore the realms that have not been explored by human beings so far, which is the reason why he's ready to take the exploration in an isolated location where no human being is present. This very idea or the very discourse of exploring, having this curiosity element is also representing the idea of phallic, uh, your, uh, the last fixation. So in and all, you definitely get to say fixations help you in providing you the emotional comfort. Because body constantly feels anxiety in our, we often feel anxiety because of the constraints that the society or the sociological order has in front of us. And fixations help us in providing the comfort to us. Just like a child is provided comfort by the very three discourses in his growth, reproductive growth. Similarly, these fixations in our maturity also helps us to comfort us from the very anxieties that we experience because of the impulse of the unconscious mind. Now let us move on to the second domain, that is the realm in which we are going to explore the concept of exploring the very idea of psychoanalysis in the discourse of interpreting uh, language structures. So language can also help you in identifying with the very concepts of psychoanalysis. How can you do that? This very concept was navigated by the French psychologist Jacques Lacan. He was very influenced by the principles of Freud because Freud believed that dreams were the road, royal road to the unconscious mind. And so whatever you are seeing, if a person is seeing something, like for instance, if you happen to see a person, this person is going to be represented in your unconscious mind, not in the way it is represented in reality. It is going to undergo a transformation. That is what the unconscious mind always does. It tries to con condense things and always displace them with similar associations. And that is how they are represented in your dream, almost vaguely. So you don't know why this person who has seen a particular person who has seen his father is now in his dream seeing himself looking at a monster and killing him. What does this mean? So that is how dreams are often represented. They are often vague, they are often ambiguous. And this is probably the reason why it, during the time, now when we are talking about this idea of exploring the language realm, that is the Lacanian realm of interpreting psychoanalysis, uh, 
you, what you'll notice is that there were many movements that were coming inspired from the Freudian concepts where images were holding a lot of significance. In particularly, there was a particular group called the Surrealist group, where you notice the very well-known painter that is Salvatore Dali is in front of you, who is very known, well known for his uh, paintings that represented the very concept of Freud. What you notice in her dreams is what he had constructed in his very paintings. So the first painting in front of you is the persistence of time, where you notice that the very painting in front of you has been represented in a very vague format. There is no uh, association that you can construct in relation to reality. What you have in front of you are these very intriguing clocks. And these clocks do not look this way in reality. They are almost in a melting position somewhere. Somewhere they're just lying as if it is a, a dead body being thrown on a bark of wood. Somewhere it is just lying on the face, on the fragmented face of an individual. This is how dreams are constructed in our mind. And that is what the painter has also tried to represent over here manifest over here manifest content in our brain is the content that is visible to us visible to us while we are sleeping and the very latent content is the representations that we establish from these very fragmented images so definitely there is a symbolic realm to all these representations there is a meaning that is there that meaning is the latin content where you're able to understand the true essence of what the poet is trying to say by exploring it with the sociological aspects around you. So this is what Laka believed in. He believed in the concept that unconscious is structured like a language, which is what we need to understand here. Now, Laka was very influenced by many other people from different fields, which is why his famous work, Ecritus, is considered to be a very complex work. Many people have not been able to understand it, because Laka never wrote his book. He only gave public lectures. And it is believed that his students actually compiled his lectures together. And that is what is available in this work, Ecritus. So nobody is really able to understand him well because it is complex with sources and references taken from different fields. He was interested in Marxism. He was interested in the very idea of uh, exploring other fields as well. And that is what makes it very complex. So you will notice that sometimes in his uh, book, you will notice that the, there are these physical diagrams, diagrams that have been taken, the concepts of optical illusions have also been incorporated in his work. So very distinct way in which he represents things. Today, we'll just be focusing on the very concept that Laka gave in the realm of language. For him also, the child was a very important subject of study because the child also has to undergo a three-plate stage. In this stage, the child is able to identify with the very idea of associating with things around it. So if the child has to express itself in a balanced format, if he wants to represent his unconscious desire through his language, he has to first undergo a development in these three spheres, that is the real, the imaginary, and symbolic. How does the child develop this very phase? How does he develop the very idea of gaining uh, exposure to these fields? We will be having an overview of what these phases are about. Now, what you notice in front of you is the cross-connected circles. They're concentric circles. You notice no sphere is can be separated from the other because each sphere is correlating the concepts of the other. So you cannot definitely represent these spheres as separate spheres. They are combined together because when you understand one realm, you gradually move to the other, but the significance of the previous realm remains with the child. And that is the reason why they are cross-connected. And when you are expressing yourself, after exploring these realms, when you start expressing yourself as an individual, you're able to explore all these three realms in the manner in which you construct your language. So let us have a look at the way in which we do construct our language in indicating all these three realms. Let us first start with the first realm, that is the imaginary phase. Although we have the real first, but I would like to start with the imaginary phase because this is a very interesting concept 
that will help us in understanding what is this phase all about. Now, this is the phase that starts for a toddler. And the general phase is when the child is just developing uh, the phase of identifying with things. All right. Now, what is important for us to understand is that how did Laka really come up with this concept of identification? Laka was very influenced by a particular experiment. This experiment was conducted by using two different individuals. The first was a toddler, a human toddler, and the other was a, a child a primate animal, a young primate animal. So both these individuals are very young in their infancy stage. He wanted to understand how would an animal respond to his mirror reflection and how would a child respond to it? What fascinated him about this experiment was that the primate animal was not interested. The moment he saw himself in the mirror, he was like, all right, that's me. And then he was busy with his work. But in the case of the toddler, he, in, he was very intrigued by this very unusual behavior where the child was very attracted by its very mirror image. Why is the child doing this? Why is he so attracted by his own image? Because this image represents the very development of our very first half of the brain, uh, very first part of our brain, that is the ego, where we develop consciousness. That's what I told you in very, the very Freudian concepts that we discussed, that ego is where you start logical reasoning. How does logical reasoning start? When your consciousness de develops, when you develop the very idea of what things are around you, the first person that you have to identify with is yourself, which is why the child is attracted by his own mirror reflection. But what is interesting in the very next image in front of you is the child is also crying. Now, why is the child crying after seeing its mirror reflection? The reason why he's crying, the reason for his crying is that there is also a sense of alienation that the child is experiencing over here. Now, why is the child experiencing alienation? Interesting question. The reason why he's experiencing alienation is mainly because the child, even though he's able to identify with himself when he's looking at the mirror, all right, this is me. Wow, this is my hairstyle. This is my, okay, this is what I'm wearing. Very nice. But there's one thing he cannot control. That is his motor movements. So he really can't control. The child is still crawling. He wants to stand just like his father or just like his mother. But the child is not able to do that. So this very inability to control his motor movements is what is causing the feeling of alienation. And this alienation is very significant factor because this definitely shows because the child is not able to perform the very role of standing on its own feet because that very phase has not developed. The child is now ready to move on to the next stage, which is the state of recognizing other objects around it. This is where the symbolic phase is going to come when he is going to identify not only with himself that he has already done over here, but in the symbolic phase, he is going to identify with people who are stronger than him. That is what the symbolic phase is about. But before we explore this symbolic realm, it's important for us to see a literary reference in which we see the mirror uh, or this very imaginary phase being represented. So again, I would like to take you back to the very poem by Lord Byron, She Walks in Beauty Like the Night, where you notice that Byron is very intrigued by this lady that he happens to see in this uh, dinner party that he goes to. What is important here is that Byron is associating with an object. And what is interesting about this association is that the qualities that Byron has inherently in himself, he was often described as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Now, why was he described that? Because there was a level of mysteriousness that was also there in Byron why he did certain things, the kind of things he was intrigued. He had a very unusual taste. And this is something you will notice in people who have very unusual way of dressing. Like often people are very, in the Bollywood industry, people are very fascinated by the way in which Ranveer Singh often dresses. It's very quirky and very unusual. But they often say that your taste 
represents your personality. The way you want to be seen is the way you try to dress yourself. And this can also be seen in the associations you build, similar association, things that you like are what are your mirror fixations, uh, sorry, your mirror identifications. So here Byron is associating with this woman who has been described as a mysterious woman. The knight is a very important symbol in this poem because that is what she is like, so mysterious, something that he cannot possess, but something very intriguing. And Byron is always interested in these thematic aspects, which is why you notice when you read his works, there is a level of unusual representation in them. They're often represented in oriental settings. All these things are definitely talking about his personality as an individual, which is what the mirror phase helps you in doing. It helps you in identifying with the very consciousness of the person, the individual. Let us now move our attention to the next phase that I spoke about, that is the phase in which the child identifies with the very presence of other individuals around it. That is probably the father. So Laka described this very uh, male representation or the fatherly representation of the father as name of the father. This is what he termed the father as. So when we talk about the father, he is a person who is controlling you. And the child is able to identify with this because he is able to identify with the social position of the father, that the father will always re remain the source of motivation and the source of emotional comfort for the mother. The mother can comfort the child, but for the mother, it is always the father who will comfort her. So which is probably the reason why the mother is, uh, the child identifies with the symbolic phase in understanding the difference between him and his father. So this is very interesting in terms of representation because this again talks about the very different fields that you have come across like structuralism. And we are talking about the very idea of binaries. You identify the black when you identify with the significance of white. And in this binary representation, one aspect is always stronger while the other aspect is always weaker. So let us understand this from an, another work that we have in front of us, which is by William Wordsworth. This is considered to be his resignation poem. They say that Wordsworth was nearly giving his resignation when he was writing this work. But why is it considered to be a resignation poem? Mainly because of the style in which he's writing. Now, before I reach to that point, I also want you to pay attention to the very line that you see in the very first stanza. These, were, these lines have been inspired or taken as a source of inspiration from the work that he had written long back, that is from the work, My Heart Leaps Up. And what you notice in the first line is a very interesting concept of binary oppositions that I was talking about. That child is the father of the man. Now, over here, although I told you that in the symbolic phase, the child knows that I am the weaker one and my father is the stronger one. Here, it is quite the opposite. Here, child is the father of the man. So that means the child is given more importance over the elder, elderly person. But why is Wordsworth doing that? What is the child able to do? What is the big uh, important point that a child has that the adult doesn't have. That very key aspect that you look about, if you look into the sociological time, the very important thing that a child possesses is his innocence. That's the reason why we say that a child is known for the innocence. You would never see a child lying that much because the child is definitely known for keeping, very, keeping that level of integrity in terms of describing things the way they seem. They don't really care about whether you like a thing or not. They can straight away say it on your face, I don't like you. So they don't follow any diplomacy in their behavior. That is the reason why the romantics were so intrigued by the child figure. Just like the psychologists were interested in child children, uh, even the romantics were interested in children because this very child figure was able to put that realization in you about the very essence a child holds, 
which is it doesn't really believe in social norms. It believes in being close proximity with nature. That is what the children in that particular age did. They enjoyed, Wordsworth enjoyed his very childhood that he would spend in his very, uh, not in the urban area, but in the rural area where he stayed, which is probably the reason why his childhood was something that he could always associate with. He, along with the other two poets are described as the late poets because he as a poet also believed that his inspiration truly lies amidst nature where he had spent his childhood memories. So this is how you can associate with the idea of binary discourse, even in word structures, but also in terms of meaning representations. Now, there's a very interesting article that is written by a very well-known critic called Lionel Trilling. And the name of the work in which, uh, in this particular work, that's called On Liberal Imagination. In this work, he talks about the very style, the trans to the transition that you notice in this particular poem where the poet is not showing resignation according to Lionel Trinney. What is being noticed here are the binary meanings that are being represented in the very poem that he has written. So in any of the stanzas that you happen to read in this particular poem, you will notice that at one front, he is representing the very romantic spirit that he addressed at one particular point of time. But slowly he's also moving towards some other images which seem to be very deviant, which seem to be very, uh, to be possessing some mature perspective in it. So in a way it is showing a level of transition from one phase to the other phase. Almost a resignation of the style, not a resignation of the very art of writing. So this is again, very interesting and intriguing to understand the very style of a poet when you do that binary opposition, because subject is important in psychoanalysis when you're analyzing a poet. Now, the last phase is the real phase. What you notice in front of you, if you say, ma'am, I don't understand anything about this work or this picture, I can totally relate with you because that is what this, this picture is supposed to do. It's supposed to make no sense at all. And that is what is the real phase. The real face is exactly like a dream, completely, you, it lacks cohesion. You just can't make sense of what this realm is all about. Now, when we try to explore this realm, Laka was also interested in many literary texts that were written. In particularly, the one writer that he constantly tried to study was James Joyce and his work called Finnegan's Wake. There's a very interesting aspect about Finnegan's Wake that I would like to share with all of you. When James Joyce was writing Finnegan's Wake, the moment he finished his book, he said, I'm going to keep the researchers and scholars busy for the next 25 years. And boy, oh boy, has he kept us busy or not? Because this particular work is so complex that you really can't understand the language and the manner in which the poet has represented his very idea in the very work. The things are so vague. It is not lacking that grammatical structure that is required in order to gain a cohesion or a kind of understanding of the way in which the poet has written the work, which is why it seems to be very uh, vague and very unclear, which is what the real is supposed to represent. But this real is also very helpful in a lot of ways. How is it helpful? Let us just understand that by another work. This is the final slide, the final work that we'll be analyzing in this lecture series uh, for today. But uh, let us have a look at this poem as well. This is the poem. Uh, this is a poem that was written by A.S.T. Coleridge. It's called Kubla Khan. Now, what is interesting about Kubla Khan is that is it, it, the subtitle of this poem is that it is a fragmented dream. That is what A.S.T. Coleridge represents in this work. Why is it called a fragmented dream? Because Coleridge was, while he was constructing this work, just before he was constructing this work, he saw the vision of this work in a dream as he was reading an oriental work, which was about the Mughal dynasty and everything, the way the orientals would live. This was a very interesting fascination for romantic poets studying the orientals. 
as I have already discussed this thing with all of you. So this is what he was doing. He was reading this work and he went to sleep. Uh, and then immediately when he woke up, he started writing the work in, on a piece of paper that this is what I'm going to write, this, this, this. But suddenly while he was writing, a man from Parlock came in the middle of his writing uh, process. And because that person came and he wanted to speak to Coleridge, what happened was that the flow of thoughts for Coleridge, that flow was not able, he was not able to maintain the flow because there was a sudden break because of the arrival of this person, which is the reason why this work is not complete. Coleridge was not able to finish this work, probably because of the fragmented representation. But if you happen to look at this poem, especially the last stanza, that is what I'm going to focus right now in, what you notice over here is that there is a lot of uh, unclear representation even in this work, especially in the last stanza. What you see in front of you is the image that is represented in the stanza itself. It's the image of a woman playing an instrument, a dulcimer. But what is interesting in the very representation of the music that this woman is playing is that the music, what this music is all about is something that we cannot understand. This is something that we have to interpret on our own, in our own mind, because we do not know the kind of music this woman is playing. There are also other aspects that are represented in this very stanza, the idea that there's a sort of warning that is represented in this very stanza where he says, beware, beware. What is this warning about? So there is a sort of unfinished representation that is done in this particular work. This is probably the reason why this work is not considered to be a complete work because there are a lot of unanswered questions in this very stanza. And that is what is the real all about it will lack clarity. When Laka was studying the real concept, now he came to the real domain very late. Earlier, he was just focusing on mirror stage and the symbolic, all that he discussed initially. But later on, when he came to the real stage, the one text that he constantly gave a reference of was the work written by Edgar Allan Poe, which is the Pauline letter about a letter that is able to travel all the horizons here and there and everywhere but nobody knows the contents of the letter. Now, why is that? Why would a poet deliberately not even tell the reader about what the content is in the work? This is a very interesting realistic representation that the real domain is explored over here because real allows you to have multiple interpretations. And those multiple interpretations can be done when you associate the very reference, the unfinished reference in accordance with the social system. So in Pauline letter, many uh, critical uh, writers have said that the reason why we do not know the contents of the letter is probably because it is showing you the power politics that happens in places where power is, uh, pow the power politics that takes place in monarchical situations between kings and queens. That is the reason why we never know what is going inside. That is always a hush-hush effect that nobody is able to explore that domain. So this is how all these three realms are definitely helping us in understanding the very three course uh, that we have understood in Lacanian concept, that is the real, the symbolic, and the image, uh, the imaginary face that has helped us to understand the very way in which language is represented and how this language is able to give us an insight of the very way in which our unconscious is representing ideas. So what is left unfinished is more important than the things that are actually represented in clarity. So definitely we are able to explore a lot. And uh, I hope that this very uh, lecture has definitely allowed you to understand with various perspectives that are associating with the psychological realm. And hopefully you're able to interpret with uh, applying uh, some of the concepts that are represented here. These are some of the books that I have used for this lecture and you can definitely refer to them and read them in order to get more insights about the very discourse of literary psychoanalysis. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Karishma. While you have a cup of water or a glass of water, 
Yeah. I would just like to take the opportunity of thanking you for such a visual treat. It has been your lecture is like a breath of fresh air. Apart from not only understanding the concepts in a very simplified manner, we also had you, you took us to a visual treat and I'm sure all those cartoons and all those, uh, those figures, figurines, whatever, I think uh, these are all your artworks that you have done by yourself. So thank you very much. Uh, we were really into it and uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, we, we didn't know how, how, how time flew. So uh, on behalf of Team Dad Voids, Shreya Ma'am and myself, I would just like to extend our, thank, our thanks, our gratitude for the effort that you have put in. And I'm sure uh, the participants who, uh, who, has been, who happened to listen to you for the first time today, this was something very, very new to them. And uh, they would look forward, uh, you know, to your future lectures as well as you are an integral part of our team. So you will definitely be seen on this platform in the near future as well. So, yeah. So uh, on behalf of Team Dadwaj, I'd like to extend my, my you know, uh, gratitude and uh, my thanks to the efforts that you have put in. There have been a few questions that are put in the chat box. Uh, I'll take the opportunity to volunteer. See, somebody has written, it is one of the best lectures I've ever heard. Oh, <laughs> thank uh, you. Thank I would you just I like to term it as a visual treat. You know? uh, the question is by Mithun K, the first question. And Mithun K says that I have a query regarding how psychoanalysis can be applied in, can be applied in young adult fiction. And how different is mimetic theory pioneered by Rene Girard from psychoanalytic theory? Hmm. All right. I would just be focusing on the first section. Yes. Uh, the, the question, the second half is not something that I'm very familiar. So uh, that little knowledge that I have about it, I would not really like to confuse you with that. But definitely the first realm that you're talking about over here is how can it be applied in young adult fiction? Fiction. That is a very interesting question that you've put, uh, put up, raised over here. Because when we talk about young adult fiction again, you notice that uh, when you talk about the representation, let's just take an example of work like Huckleberry Finn. When you read these child fictions that Mark Twain was writing, there is a level of inner meaning that you need to focus more on. Because again, like I told you, when you're doing psychoanalysis, you have to start from one realm to the other realm of the mind. That is from ego, then you move towards the super ego and then towards the unconscious. So the focus has to be on those representations that are unusual. So that you're only able to do when you're able to identify with the character and the way the character behaves. Like when we talk about young adult fiction, especially when we talk about the work by Mark Twain, there are a lot of homosexual representations that are often interpreted in his works. Now, this tendency, again, was interpreted because people were able to identify with the behavior of the character, which is what you should be focusing on, the way in which the characters are expressing or behaving in the particular text, what are they representing and why are they behaving in a particular manner, this very association that the characters share with each other helps you in identifying with their emotional association. So, yes, I think partly that is the most. I hope I've answered your question to some level. But yeah, I think you could do it in that way. That is how it's because the innocence is always there in child fiction. Like if you come across even Lewis Carroll's work, Alice in, the Wonderland, uh, Alice in Wonderland, this is again a work which is considered to be a very child uh, classic. Everybody reads this, but again, there are multiple layers to it, the political realm, the queen that is represented in that particular work, how she is representing the very idea of uh, control, dominance. And uh, so you can definitely explore these realms. And that is what psychoanalysis helps you in doing is understanding the sociological discourses and the ways our unconscious is able to address its control in the very way and the manner in which things are represented. So, yeah. Thank you. The next question is by Pallavi Chakravarti and Pallavi says, she, her question is, uh, 
her question is to the theory of castration mm -hmm. and she asks that can we think of subversive practices such as protest marches lesbianism strip tease belly dance queer tango and other forms of erotic performances as acts of deliberate castration as a deliberate act of letting go of the phallus to embrace the maternal or the poetic Oh, that's a very interesting question again. Now, in order to address this question, I would like to take you to the French psychoanalysts, like uh, when you come across writers like Hélène Chichou, and when you talk about writers, uh, French writers in particular, when they were taking the psychoanalytical discourse, they were definitely talking about the very idea of why, because when you talk about these actions, like these actions of uh, being very uh, openly outspoken about your very sexuality, this idea is something that has been curbed all this while and the reason why it has been curbed is basically because again that represents the castration principle the fact that women cannot express themselves their sexuality that openly this is the subversion that the male patriarchy has in a way addressed to women which is the reason why french psychoanalysts constantly focus on the idea of being very vocal about your sexuality so this is something that is important in a way. In her very famous work, especially Elaine Chishu, she wrote a work called The Laugh of Medusa, in which she again talks about the very idea of why is Medusa castrated, or in a way, her very beheading is considered to be an act of castration. Why is that in a way performed? Because Medusa has the tendency to express herself without being concerned about the social restraints. That's the strength that she has within her, which is probably the reason why women are being so, uh, the outrageous impetus that you notice in women is also a reaction to this very response that are represented in the Greek character. So I think that is something that is very important for us to understand why is this like the Me Too movement. I, this was again a way of representing your identity in a very, uh, you know, the unconscious is representing itself in a provocative way and not being concerned about the very constrictions that are imposed by the society. But again, we have to find a midway because what happens in this is like when you come across psychoanalysts like Zizek, they have criticized the very Me Too movement by saying that this is just a power politics of women when they are able to address themselves and their sensuality that openly. And the only way and the discourse I feel is uh, rather than taking the revolting uh, practice, it is important for you to take the balance format again over there because like unconscious is impulsive. So impulsive reactions are seen through this these formats and a balanced format would be when you are accepting, allowing the society to accept your opinion, but also allowing yourself to be, uh, you know, finding an output in which you can express yourself, which is what the female writers usually do. If you come across writers like Virginia Woolf, what they did in their work was something very unusual for the time. They were able to address the concern, but through that poetic skill. So you are somewhere in the balanced mode when you are poetically expressing yourself and not in the rampant way in which the unconscious always does. That has its own loop sides. So, yeah. Thank you. The next question is by Tariq Ali. He asks that what kind of social or personal events, except not being appreciated as expected, grows the concept of Thanatos in a, personal, in a, in a person's personality? All right. Yeah, Thanatos, again, is mainly something that evolves out of the social constraints like I, like I talked about, because this is something that is emerging, this energy. When we talk about eros, that is the energy that keeps up the spirit of being alive. All right. That is what the sexuality, the realm of sexuality, the unconscious is constantly wanting to be alive. And that is what eros is also representing in our very behavioral process. But when we talk about Thanatos, Thanatos is something that I feel is very rampantly expressed in our behavior today, because it's almost like the manner in which the constraints are coming to us are something that even uh, patients were experiencing, the war patients in particular when I'm talking, because when Freud came up with this concept of Thanatos, 
his main inspiration were the war patients, the soldiers who were going in the field uh, and uh, on the field, and they were literally experiencing that death threat that was imposing, again, certain behavioral symptoms in their bodies, such as shell shock. So this is something that uh, can be explored at greater levels when we understand the very aspects that are generating the feeling of Thanatos within us in order to explore them at that wide range. So yeah, like we have seen it in the case, I talked about Bella Hadid also, these contemporary people who are well-known public figures who are experiencing a similar thing because of the constant demand that are imposed on them. In spite of having it all, they're not really able to enjoy things at the optimum level because they feel that their purpose is not fulfilled. Eros is not able to satisfy itself. So that is when you go to the opposite extreme of Thanatos to a certain level. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is by Arijit Das. And his question is, what would be the difference between psychoanalysis applied in literary fiction and psychoanalysis applied in nonfiction? For example, nonfictions written by Anne Frank, Marcus Aurelius, Victor Frank, etc. All right, that's a good question. Now, when we talk about nonfiction works, you see, uh, the thing that you need to understand about fiction is that there are things that are often concealed in fiction. You're not really telling the true source. You're not really telling what is it all about. These are the things that you notice in fiction. It is constructed. So there are certain things that are underlying. So there is a lot of uh, technique that is involved in terms of understanding the initial elements and then decoding them. Whereas when you talk about nonfiction, nonfiction is something that doesn't really have that kind of discourse. So there again, you have to understand the very discourse of psychoanalysis does become easy because you are able to identify with the very source who is talking about the thing and you're able to associate with the things again very well. And uh, I think the main difference mainly lies in the manner in which you are representing things in the manner in which the artist is, your focus is only the artist. Like when you talk about painters, their work is also to a certain level, it does seem like a construct, a non, uh, a fictional construct, but it is definitely talking about their psyche to a certain level. And that is something easy because we know that the artist is constructing it. Like, when we talk about works like Leonardo, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, they are again, many of the paintings have been analyzed on the perspective of the author centric thing, then focusing on the perspective of the sociological thing. So I think the focus shifts in nonfiction because there you're just focusing on the artist only. Whereas when you talk about fiction, we have to consider a lot of parameters before we reach the artist. So yeah, I think that is the, chief difference that we get to see in fiction and non-fiction. Uh, thank you. We take the last question of the day by Saloni and her question is, how could be psychoanalytic theory, analytical theory be applied to fantasy genres like Lord of the, uh, Lord of the Rings? Oh, that, that fantasy fictions, when you talk about that, that is completely the unconscious realm in front of you because there's nothing in association with reality. So whatever elements are represented, you have a very free level at which you can interpret them, associate them with the real world. So I think that is what is important. Like I talked about Alice in Wonderland again, that is considerably the aspects that Alice is seeing in that very unreal world is definitely representing uh, those elements, unreal elements, again, uh, are allowing you to interpret things at multifold levels, which is what fantasy also helps in. It definitely helps you in structuring things at a multiple interpretation perspective, which is why fantasy is supposed to be more interesting, probably, than when we talk about the nonfiction elements. That is where the difference really lies. So in uh, fantasy definitely you can go all the way around you can explore things at various dimensions and uh, this can genuinely be done by the way in which elements are represented so if you cannot be very confirmed like if you take up a particular uh, aspect in a particular work it need not have a very fixed meaning which is always visible when you talk about a construct where things are very direct where you will definitely be taking the symbolic course, like this is what she's talking about. Like, let's say if you take a work that is written by, just recently I read this very influential work by Spivak called Can the Subaltern Speak? Now in this work, what she says is that 
uh, while beginning her essay, she constantly talks about the very idea of how she wants to focus on the informal conversation of two very well-known French intellectuals and not on their formal works. Because in the informal conversation, she is able to identify with the free association very easily. Whereas in the formal constructions, there is something that is always underlying hidden within it. So this is something that you're able to do with fantasy aspects very well, because things are always underlying in layers in fantasy. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we come to the end of this very engaging session. Thank you very much for such an engaging session. Before we complete, we finish the session. May I request Shreya Ma'am um, to please convey her word of thanks. Over to you, Shreya Ma'am. Well, uh, very good evening to everyone. And uh, today we are at the middle of our series. This was the seventh lecture, as all the participants know. And uh, it's hard to believe that we are already halfway through. And uh, on behalf of Team Dad Voyage, Shoikat and myself, I extend my warmest gratitude to Dr. Karishma Bisht for a very, very intriguing and a brilliant session. Uh, I must say, Dr. Karishma, that I was completely floored by the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of pictures, the, the, uh, your drawings, they were outstanding. I think they added so much more to the lecture. You know, each, uh, each individual slide was a visual treat in itself. And of course, when you uh, kind of spoke about it, we could relate so much more, you know. I, I really think that you are a wonderful artist too. And uh, today we were in for a dual treat. You know, first of course was your uh, conceptual brilliance and added to that was the visual treat. So I think all of us who were there today for this very engaging presentation, we have gained a lot. And I must also thank you for making, you know, concepts which almost all of us were introduced to as students, but which never really became clear. You know, you began with the very basics, starting from uh, Freud's, you know, ego, superego, id, and then moved on to uh, Lacan and, you know, so many things in between. And the way you kind of coalesced them with the major romantic writers, I think that added so much more to, uh, what what otherwise it would have been you know like i think most of the students and as shoikat has been must have told you that this is a this is a platform where we have participants who are undergrad students and also you know uh, people who are teaching so it's a very heterogeneous group so i think uh, there was a lot for everyone to take on from your lecture and uh, i i really think you have already been here at that voyage several times and we look forward to having you here uh, several times more in the future. In fact, I would like to ask uh, Shoikat to uh, request Dr. Karishma to become one of our core team because I think uh, all of us would gain uh, immensely from that. So Definitely. once again, <laughs> yes. So once again, uh, on behalf of Team Dad Voyage, thank you for sparing your time and being with us this evening. And thank you all the participants for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you the volunteer team for their invisible assistance as always. And uh, tomorrow we look forward again to an engaging evening where we would be listening to modernism and postmodernism. We meet again tomorrow at six in the evening. Till then, stay safe all of you and take care of yourselves. Good, Good night. night. Good night, thank you.